Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I'm talking to two nationally renowned ethicists, Professor Jeffrey Kahn and Professor Nancy Cass, who are the director and deputy director of the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins University. I spoke with them about whether it's right to publicly disclose information about people who are sick with COVID-19, about society's obligations to people who are quarantined, and about whether it's time to start thinking about how to allocate critical healthcare resources in case this epidemic stretches the health system beyond its capacity to care for everyone. Let's listen. Dr. Khan and Dr. Cass, thank you so much for joining me. I think we're at the point in this coronavirus situation where it's important to talk about some ethical questions that are coming up. And I'd like to start with you, uh, Dr. Khan. Um, when there is a case that's announced, there's a huge clamor for information. Who's the person? Where have they been? Um, a lot of personal information. Some of it's coming out. Some of it isn't. There's frustration when people want to know more but are told they can't. Is this issue of patient privacy an, an ethical issue, and, and how should people understand that? Thanks for that question, Josh, and I think it is definitely an ethical issue and an important one to assess as the outbreak continues. So we have a lot of experience in public health with um, contact tracing when an infectious disease is identified in, an, in a community, and I think this ought to be handled in the same way, where uh, disease is reported to the public health authorities and they then um, search out the, the contacts of the individual who have been in, has been infected and advise them about the, the proper approach. And the reason that we don't um, out people effectively is for all sorts of reasons related to trust and people's willingness to go to physicians when they're sick if they worry about what will happen to their privacy and so forth. So I think this is not a, a new issue for public health. We have uh, built up processes that are protecting of privacy, but uh, achieving public health goals, and we ought to treat this situation in the same way. Dr. Cass, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. I mean, particularly now in 2020, we are in an era of uh, social media and a, a fair amount of um, ostracizing of people where we have fears. And um, as Jeff said, we don't want to create a situation where people are anxious about going to their physician to get tested for coronavirus because they're worried that their name will now be publicly out there somewhere and then they get shunned by their neighbors and there's a lot of uh, finger pointing and blame. Public health has learned over the years that it can be just as effective without doing names. So it's a, it's sort of a core tenet of public health ethics that if you can be just as effective and avoid some of the negatives and harms, um, that's the way to go. Um, having I uh, appreciate that those points uh, a lot, um, but I wonder when somebody has been somewhere where people are exposed. There's also sort of a countervailing need to tell people, like if you were bowling on this lane at this time, you know, call the public health department. So it's not, it's a balance, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's a balance, but that doesn't mean that you uh, literally need to name the names. Now, obviously, in some situation, it will be quite obvious to people who the index patient, so to speak, was. But to say, look, you were in the bowling alley last night, and we now realize that uh, someone um, who was also at the bowling alley was infected. We want to. We want you to take your temperature and monitor yourself. Um, again, is a way of 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 doing what public health needs to do without, as Jeff said, um, outing people. Great, um, Dr. Khan. Last word on this question. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Nancy there, and I think you're right to to put it as a kind of balancing question. So. Obviously, contact tracing can only take take us so far, and we pursue that as we can. But when you don't know all the people who have been exposed, then it's important to alert the relevant public. But that does not require 
naming names, obviously sometimes that may lead to a narrowing of who the individuals might be, and that's, uh, uh, again, a balance to be struck and a consideration for the public health authorities. Great. Okay, I want to move on to another ethical question that's come in, and this is the ethics relating to social distancing. I think people have talked about different social distancing um, ideas like um, staggering the work schedule, asking people to telecommute, canceling major events, um, or even moderate events, um, closing school, asking people to stay home when they're sick, um, which is a good practice anyway. Uh, And those actually impose different kinds of burdens on different people. um, Because if you're in an industry that suddenly everything's canceled, then you know, you may not be able to have work and to provide for your family. What are the, the ethical responsibilities um, of society in a way when, when these major decisions are made to protect the public health? Maybe I'll direct that to Dr. Cass. Yeah, it's, it's another great question. So, so I want to maybe separate out two different categories of the, of the kinds of harms that you're talking about, Josh. One are the harms that are imposed on individuals. I am personally asked to stay home and self-quarantine for 14 days versus the um, harms that can happen to entire industries, right? The airline industry, the restaurant industry, the conference industry. For the, for the first category, it seems that, again, like with our first example, we have so much history in public health to know that social distancing is effective, that we need to put it in place. But that's not the end of the discussion. and it's, it's really almost the beginning of the discussion in terms of ethics. If we know that social distancing is effective, part of the question is, what do we owe to people to make sure that while we essentially ask them to take on the burden of staying home for 14 days, that they are not disproportionately harmed? So it may be things as simple as making sure that there's a delivery of food to them, making sure that they have good phone service and internet so that they can be connected to um, loved ones. It may be replacing um, salary for them depending on the industry they're in. But public health needs to know that um, when it imposes this kind of burden on people for the sake of everyone else, it's not really for their benefit, it's for the sake of everyone else, that this can be done in a way where the fewest harms possible um, uh, eventually occur to these um, individuals. Great. Dr. Khan, anything you'd like to add? I would just add that, that the burdens may well fall dis- disproportionately to, to different parts of the population, and we should be sensitive um, to that. And just to add to what Nancy said, I think it's really critical for employers to make sure that their employees can do work from a distance and make sure they have the tools to, to do that. In some industries, that will not be possible, of course. And then there needs to be a, an approach to make sure people are cared for, don't don't lose income in ways that make them unable to live. Um, and of course, that's a, a big part of the conversation. Even today, we're hearing about that in our, in our federal government, about what to do for income replacement for people who can't work. Um, so that's, I, that, I think no, that's, not, that's not just an economic issue, it's an ethical issue ab- in a way. Absolutely. And, and in particular, because the, the burdens, the, the economic and social burdens will, will not fall equally across the population. I, I want to ask you both a more difficult question that's a subset of this, which is for healthcare workers who are really you know, going to be putting themselves uh, to a certain extent at risk, taking care of people who are quite ill from the novel coronavirus. What, what are the ethical obligations of society for, for them, for, for their work? Um, maybe Dr. Cass? So there is some kind of um, commitment that healthcare workers make in in signing up for the profession they have, but it's not um, an infinite commitment. So there is, again, some kind of reciprocal obligation that their employer has to them. There's an expectation that they will be working in as um, safe an environment as possible. So there is a duty for the uh, healthcare institution or employer to make sure that there are sufficient uh, protective equipment, masks, um, filtered air, things that actually allow them to work in as safe um, an environment as possible, literally even having time to go home and sleep so that they're, they're um, on their game and guaranteeing them that they will get care should they, should they become sick. I think there's also a group of employees who work in healthcare institutions that we often don't think about. Doctors and nurses take these kinds of professional 
oath that they will respond in the time of emergency. But the janitors, the people who clean the rooms, the people who are doing food service in hospitals never took that kind of oath. It's a, it's a job that they got hired to do. And making sure that we are mindful of protecting them, making sure that they also are allocated um, safe working conditions um, is, is another thing we need to be thinking about. Great. Dr. Khan, anything you'd like to add? Well, well, to, to pick up on the, the granular um, notion that Nancy just identified, that not all workers are the same, and I think we have expectations of certain healthcare workers, uh, physicians and nurses being at, at the top of that list, that they will, um, as part of their oath, continue in their role, even when there's risk to their own health, obviously with all the protections that can be offered, but that we should allow other kinds of workers, custodial staff would be the obvious example to opt out if they don't feel that it's safe for them to, to be in the workplace um, and, and then sufficient protections can't be provided. So there's, I think, a, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's not a single category and it's important to recognize that and do what we can for the, the things that are relevant for the particular individuals in particular categories. Great. Um, I want to switch to one last question, which has to do with um, the uh, healthcare system. And, you know, right now um, in the United States, uh, the hospitals are taking care of all the patients that are sick. We've heard reports, though, for different times, other parts of the world where the hospitals have really struggled to take care of all the patients. And, um, you know, how do you think now, uh, from an ethical perspective, the healthcare system should be preparing for that kind of situation. Um, I'll just say that certainly part of that is obviously to do everything to avoid it, which is why there's so many different um, activities to avoid it. People um, have talked about also the ability to transfer patients from place to place, but what kind of ethical preparation should be going on now um, in uh, anticipation uh, of that kind of scenario, um, not to cause undo alarm, but what do you think is prudent at, at this point? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Khan. This is, I think, a really important question and one that will be um, evolving rapidly as it has over other parts of the world. And, and I think it's important to start talking about how we allocate resources most effectively and, and fairly. Um, let's hope we don't get to the point where there aren't enough resources to treat all the people who need to be treated in particular locations. So hopefully we can move people and maybe move um, materiel around where the patients are. But we need to think about how to triage effectively in, in the most appropriate ways. And that's a, that's a complicated conversation. We're having that conversation in, in Maryland. Actually, it's a part of a project led by members of the faculty here at the Berman Institute. It's been an ongoing discussion for, boy, probably seven, eight years now. Um, and is now becoming much more relevant to think about how to do this in the most effective and transparent way. So that's among the things to say. Um, among the ethical concerns is not just how we do it, but how we um, communicate what we're doing and why is a policy matter so that the public understands and, and why it's, it's being proposed the way it is, what it, how it's justified from an ethics perspective. And so there isn't um, confusion and on top of the concerns that would be raised by shortages and um, stress to the system. Dr. Cass, anything you'd like to add? I think the only thing I would add to what Jeff said is, is maybe to underscore that the more thinking we can do in advance, the less stress there will be on individual healthcare workers who are working their hardest under very difficult conditions to have to make one-off decisions one after the other. The, we, we, we know there's something called moral distress that doctors and nurses face when they feel like it's on their personal shoulders to make some really tough decisions, for example, about allocation of a bed or a ventilator. Whereas if there are uh, systems or policies that are worked out in advance, because Honestly, these situations are predictable when we have a really, really bad um, health um, context or outbreak like this. The, the more we have some policies and systems worked out in advance of the system, the, the circumstances under which someone might be removed from a ventilator or the circumstances under which someone might go from um, a certain healthcare setting to um, a, a spillover 
uh, setting, the less that's on the shoulders of individual healthcare providers. And that seems like um, something that is helpful. And then building on what Jeff said, to be transparent with patients and families in advance that this is the way this um, emergency context works. Wow. Um, well, I really appreciate your best thoughts on this. And we may circle back to you in this podcast as this uh, situation continues to evolve. Thank you both so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.